All right, let's do some welding on a T-plate. We're going to run some 1 8 to 70 18. And guys, what you're going to want to start with is get some tacks on the ends of uh, this, these two pieces of plate here. You're going to want to get them fairly square. If anything, lean it a little bit away from where you're going to be welding. That way, once you get a couple of passes on here, it's going to pull it straight or past square. And then you can weld on the other side as well to kind of yank it back if you want to try to keep these straight. But keep in mind, this bottom edge is going to bow up regardless of what you do. So, with that being said, put a tack on each end, and then we're going to go down here to the far side, and we're going to start up, and we're going to run this rod as far as we can, and then I will show the process of overlapping these beads without running the whole thing out. So I'll get the first stringer set, I'll leave a little gap down here, and then I'm going to just go ahead and stack these beads accordingly, like you would if you were going to take a T-plate test. Now when you do this in school, you're probably going to run quite a few of these, you're going to get good at it and it's not going to be a big deal, but for those that don't know how to do it and you want to learn how to do it at home, we're going to show you how, right here. Hey right, guys, here we go, the first thing we're going to do with our piece of T-plate, <clears throat> we've got our machine set at 125 amps and we are running 1 8 7018 H4R rod, it's an Excalibur rod and we're going to fire up right here on this tack right here at the edge and we're going to run this bead all the way down. So what we're gonna do with this first pass right here in this edge is we're just barely going to oscillate just a little bit. And sometimes a lot of people will just poke this in the corner and they'll point the rod back and let that sucker build up. Now, you can do that if you do it just right. Uh, the last thing you wanna do is get any slag entrapment uh, ahead of where you're going. So just barely maintaining that little bitty space with your rod aimed back just a little bit with a little bit of oscillation is going to help you fill that out appropriately. And you just want to make sure that you eliminate any slag inclusion right here inside of this edge. Uh, it's just not something if you go to get a bend test and there's a little bit of slag in there, it'll bust you out if you're not careful. All right, when you fire up on these, you don't want too much motion. We're just going to barely scratch it right here and immediately go right back to where we were starting at. So if this was your starting point, basically all I'm saying you're wanting to do is you're just barely right ahead of that. You're going to just scratch, kind of pull it back a little bit, give yourself a touch of a long arc, and then go straight back into where you want to take off. Give it one swoop of oscillation and go from there. So back here in the corner, that's what we're going to do. We're going to just touch the corner of this, and we're just barely going to long arc it. Go right to where we want to start, and we're going to poke that in there. The tighter your rod gap is... When you weld with 7018, the less chance you have of including any type of porosity in your weld. If you can eliminate that rod gap, I've seen videos all over TikTok where people say you want to maintain uh, whatever number they give out of an arc gap. No, if you're welding with 7018, you want that arc gap to be tight. The tighter you get that in there, the less your chances you're going to have porosity. Don't believe the arc gap stuff on 7018. Keep it tight, keep it close, keep it good, strong quality weld. All right, let's fire up on this thing, shall we? Keeping the camera a little ways away, what I'm gonna do is when I start my arc, I'm gonna get right up here on this rod, I'm gonna scratch it, and then I'm gonna pull my hand back to where it is comfortable. This rod's gonna get hot over time, so you can't hold on to it for forever, but when you get that arc initiated, you can pull your hand back and you can get it comfortable where it's not gonna get too hot. So. Anyway, here we go. I like to generally start off with it down here, get a hold of my rod, and then as I start to weld, I will pull that hand back up to where I'm holding my stinger. And with eighth rod, I don't always do that. We're just going to fire up like this. We'll show you how it looks going that way instead of the other. So here we go. Just going to fire up, and then we're going to barely long arc and go right back to where we want to initiate that puddle. Want that puddle to fill out. You want to be able to see that puddle from where you're going. Excuse me, from where you've been. You want it to maintain a consistent size. Everybody learns at their own pace and everybody makes mistakes. And the mistakes is what's going to teach you the most. So with all that being said, guys, that first pass. Let me get a hold of a rod here. That first pass is really just about making a little bit of contact with the top and barely taking it down to the bottom. That is all I did on this first pass here. Just a little bit back and forth, keeping it jammed into that corner on this leading edge here. As you can see, you never want to see that slag puddle get ahead of you. When you've got that puddle initiated and you can see it behind uh, where you've been and where you're going, that little bit of slag that you see in front of your puddle 
You want that to be as small as you can possibly get it. If that slag puddle in front of you starts to build up to where it looks like it's about a third or half the size of the puddle as far as uh, comparison to where you've been, if that slag puddle gets too big in front of where you're going, you're going to have slag inclusion in there. And if you're taking a weld test and you're getting ready to have this thing bent, it is going to bust you if you're not careful. You get a big old puddle of slag in front of this and you weld over the top of it, you may not see it. It may look perfectly fine on the outside, but I tell you what, as soon as they go to cut into this thing and they give it a bend, if there was slag inclusion in there, it's going to be a massive void and you're just not going to be happy with the results. So make sure you keep that front side of that puddle small as you can keep it. You don't want to see slag up there. So we're going to cover this video, how to make a seamless weld here on these T-plates like we've been talking about in all these videos lately. So I ran the first bead up to about there. If that's right here is where I took that swoop and I tied into that existing bead and I took off that way with it. So basically what you're going to do on these guys is take your rod when you go to fire up. And here is how you're going to want to do this. You are just barely going to want to start right in front of this. You're going to want to make your little peck scratch right there. You're going to want to take it. And if you go backwards with it, you're going to want to take it and you're going to start at the top and you're going to swoop to the bottom and then you're going to go back up and grab that top side. Now, I generally like to just barely peck it. I'll long arc it just ever so slightly and I immediately go back to right where I want this tie-in to be, start at the top and I swoop it down and then I go back up and grab this top side edge right here. So guys, again, just scratch long arc back in, swoop and go up. This takes a second to do this. It takes a lot of practice to make your tie-ins look good. Obviously doing on a piece of T-plate like this is going to be easier than doing it overhead or vertical. So <clears throat> you're going to find a groove for you that works. Um, some people like to just drag it from way back here and hit where they want to fire up. It's all fine and dandy unless you're running x-ray. Uh, if you long arc way up ahead and you don't get those little pinholes burnt out, you know, obviously most people aren't running x-ray on the structure. Uh, but for plate, the same, or the pipe, the same thing applies. You don't want to have too much travel with long arcing and scratching around up here. And, I mean, a lot of places, if you're taking a test, you can't fire up up here and run down and tie into your bead. So, strike up right in front, go to the back, swoop over the top, and then go right back up to your top side edge. Your second pass is going to sit not dead center like that last one was, but you're going to stick this thing right in the groove of that previous weld if you can see it right there let me get this camera turned a little bit and guys if you had to pick one or the other you want to favor the center of this bead just a hair i mean get 60 percent coverage over your prior bead and 40 percent layout on your piece of plate here you want about a 60 40 coverage and the same thing applies on this next pass that you're going to make here to do your third pass you're going to stick it right in the corner and just barely favor that top side. Make sure your puddle gets a good tie-in to the top piece of the plate here. And then gravity is going to help you catch the one below it. So with that being said, when you fire up on that third pass, you can almost poke it right in the center, just ever so slightly favoring the top side of this piece of plate as opposed to your previous weld. All right, guys, here's your example of that third pass going in on this piece of T-plate here. If you're taking a weld test, you got your root pass down, you got your second pass here, and your third pass up top. Some places are going to let you do a weave on this. Uh, some places are not. I don't know if you're if you're going to welding school. Uh, that may or may not be something that they teach. Um, I encourage you to get really good at running stringers. Uh, stringer beads is going to be the preferred method in a lot of places, especially especially if you move on to pipe. Uh, things like refineries, they only allow a bead to be 1.5 times the size of your rod very often, which is not given much leeway for any kind of weave. So definitely get good at your stringers. Uh, like I said in the last video, you want to cover about 60%, if not a hair more of that first pass with your second bead. And then your third bead is going to go right up in here in the corner, and you're going to have about 50%, maybe 60% coverage of that second bead with your third bead. So that gives it a nice, flat, smooth look right there. And as you go up, you're going to do the same thing. Same thing all the way up, no matter how much you're putting in here. You want to keep that nice and level all the way up, and just keep it looking good. Practice those tie-ins. 
Another trick of the trade, guys, is if you're allowed to do 1.5 times the size of your rod and your beads, uh, in the previous videos we've got two stacked on top of the root pass here on this piece of T-plate, after you get those two initially done, if you run two stringers, you can really slow down your travel speed a little bit and just barely oscillate on this piece of T-plate here, if I can get it to move a little bit closer to you. Just barely oscillate on this piece of T-plate and cover that first stringer and get about 50 to 60% coverage on the third one that you've got up here with your fourth. So if you slow down just a touch, barely oscillate and keep that rod angle pointed into your puddle, uh, you can really get away with doing two stringers on top of your root and then two stringers on top of that. And if they're looking for a three bead cap, then you can speed it up a little bit and you can cover everything with three or four stringer passes like so. Boys and girls, let's talk about tie-ins. This is something that can make or break your weld if you're taking a weld test. So regardless of whether or not you're welding plate or pipe, you want to stagger your starts and stops. If you run a long piece of plate on a test and say you break off right in the middle, if your rod burns out right about the middle of that piece of plate, here's what you wanna do. You really want to stagger these out because if you stop and start every time just like this, if you go in to take a bend test and they bend one right there, there's a much higher chance that something's gonna go wrong right there with all those stacked up starts and stops. So what I encourage you to do is if you're still in school, practice your starts and stops a whole lot. Don't burn a whole rod 50% of the time. Stop it and break off the flex if you need to and restart. That way you can split where your takeoffs and restarts are and not keep them all in one spot. Being able to consistently fire up and restart and tie in to an existing bead is going to help you so much out in the field. Get really good at restarts and tie-ins, guys. It'll make or break you. One more thing I want to mention, guys. Anytime you're taking a weld test or whatever you're doing, I want you to consider this one thing. What you have underneath, your top side is going to reflect that. So there's going to be like your cap pass when you're putting your cap on. By the time you get everything filled out to where you're putting your stringer cap on it, your weave cap, whatever it's going to be, you might be able to hide what's underneath a little bit. In the end, it's going to reflect what's underneath. So if you've got a bunch of fat spots and real skinny spots and some ugly stuff that you think you're just going to cover up, the smoother you make those, the smoother your cap is going to be. You cannot rely on your cap pass to cover all the garbage underneath. If it's not smooth and it's not consistent, it's going to be extremely difficult to make a cap smooth and consistent. Your top side reflects your bottom side, guys. Just keep that in mind when you're welding. If you've got a very smooth root pass, smooth fill passes, and then you go in to put your cap on, it's going to be way easier to give it a nice, smooth, good look if underneath it looks good as well. So there you have it, guys. This piece right here is ready for your three-pass cap. If that's what you're going to do, you got your first pass here, which is your root pass. Uh, your second pass, it covers the bottom half. Uh, third pass covers the top half. And then I went back over it again with a wider two-bead pass on top of this to set me up for a three-bead cap. So in the future, we'll get, your, uh, get you a three-bead cap video put out here. But this is what it looks like, root pass, second pass, third pass, fourth pass, fifth pass. And then you'll have 6th, 7th, and 8th to cover this up completely and finish it off with a cap. So again, like I've said in prior videos, the cap is going to reflect everything that's underneath. If it ain't nice, smooth, and pretty underneath, your cap is not going to be uh, looking great. Uh, if it is, it, you probably had to work so much harder to make that cap pass look good if it had to cover up a bunch of junk. So the smoother you can get those prior passes uh, in there and the better you can make those look, the easier it's going to be to develop a beautiful cap. Guys, if there's anything that you'd like to see specifically, please let me know in the comments. Um, if you need any more details on any of the stuff that I've done here, just let me know. We'll see what we can figure out.